First, I would like to thank the brothers here at Al Masjid al Sunnah al Nabawi. In Germantown, Philadelphia, I would like to thank the brothers and the community for inviting me and the other du'at and doing something that Allah Azawajal has informed would be a means of our salvation, as Allah Azawajal mentioned in the Quran. Where Allah Azawajal has informed that by time men would go astray except those who believe and do righteous deeds and come together with the truth and come together with patience. We got a message uh, from the sisters, please keep your, the sisters please be quiet and keep your children quiet. Barakallahu feekun. So we ask Allah Azawajal to bless the community here and to bless their efforts and to place it on their scale of good deeds on a day of judgment because they brought the community together to work collectively upon the truth and to work collectively upon patience. May Allah Azawajal place it on their scale of good deeds. The topic that uh, is being discussed is the work of Shaykh Abdul Rahman al Saadi, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, the Shaykh of our scholars, um, Al Wasail Al Mufida Lil Hayat Al Sa'ida, which translates as the beneficial means to the happy life. And we all look for a happy life. We all look for ease and comfort, even in this life, before the next life. So Shaykh Abdul Rahman al Saadi, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, has given us some advice as it relates to obtaining comfort in this life and in preparation for the next life. And from that which he mentioned, as you have it in front of you, um, from the decisive means that result in happiness and the removal of anxiety and worry is striving to eliminate the causes of anxiety and to obtain the means that bring about happiness. So from that portion of the book, we find that the Shaykh Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he mentions as sa'yu fi izalat al-asbab al-jaliba lil humum. So the individual first, he tries to remove what brings about anxiety and worry and the likes. So one of the benefits is that anxiety is one of the one of the diseases of the heart. The anxiety is from the diseases of the heart. Just like disbelief is a disease of the heart. Hypocrisy is a disease of the heart. So anxiety and worry and grief is something that harms your heart. As it was mentioned by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi and even before, now as it was mentioned by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi in a book titled Amrad al-Qulub, the diseases of the heart. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah says Al-Ghammu wal-Ghaythu wal-Huznu Kullu hadihi alam tahsulu fin nafs He said uh, anxiety and anger So he says Afwan, he says worry, anxiety or worry, evil and anxiety all of these are things that take place in the soul All of these are things that take place in the soul. So we understand that anxiety is from the diseases of the heart. And he says, further down, he says, Falahu mawtun wa maradun wa hayatun wa shifa. So the heart has, the heart can die, the heart can become sick, the heart has life, and the heart has cures. So we should understand that as Muslims. We should understand the affair of our hearts. 
Your heart has life and your heart has death. Your heart has that which makes it sick and your heart has that which makes it strong. And because of that we find that Allah Azza wa Jal constantly reminds the believers of the affairs of the heart. Allah Azza wa Jal constantly in the Quran, in many verses of the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal speaks to the believers and informs them about their heart. Right? So you have uh, the death of the heart, you have the life of the heart, you have the cures for the heart, and the likes. And he says, وَحَيَاتُهُ وَمَوْتُهُ وَمَرْدُهُ وَشِفَاؤُهُ أَعْظَمُ مِنْ حَيَاتِ الْبَدِمُ He says, the life of your heart, and this is very important for us to understand, the life of your heart, the sickness of your heart, the cures for your heart, and the likes, it's more important for you to understand than the life and the sickness of your body. Because, and the reason why Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah says that is because when your body becomes sick or ill or dies, then it only ends your life in this life. But when your heart becomes sick, when your heart dies, it affects this life and, and the next life. So the affair of the believer is the believer understands that you have to focus on the illnesses of the heart more than you focus on the illnesses of your body. Because the illnesses of your body only brings an end or discomfort in this life. Whereas the illness of the heart would affect this life and the next. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, أَفَلَا يَعْلَمُ إِذَا بُعْثِرَ مَا فِي الْقُبُورِ وَحُسِّنَ مَا فِي الصُّدُورِ Allah Azza wa Jal says, do they not know when the graves are brought up and that which is in the chest is exposed. And that which is in the chest is exposed. So we understand that the illnesses of the heart, it's very important for the believer to realize that there are illnesses of the heart and for the believer, no. Mention of our brothers on the second floor. Could you completely clear the second floor so that the sisters could go on that floor and go to the third floor, inshallah, to the third floor of people? So. Huh? So the brothers, the brothers on the second floor should clear the second floor? Clear the entire second floor. Outside. So there's some sisters that are standing outside? And there's no room, so we're asking the brothers to clear the second floor. The brothers should go to the third floor. Let the brothers go to the third floor. The sisters are going to come to the second floor. So we understand. the. So, for, so first, to acknowledge and to understand that there are diseases of the heart. As Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا In the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions about the hypocrites. Allah says, in their heart is a disease. So Allah increased them in disease. Allah increased them in disease. So the diseases of the heart. Shaykh al-Islam, in that same statement, in the diseases of the heart, he said, he said, مَرَضُ الْقَلْبِ إِذَا وَرَدَ عَلَيْهِ شُبْحَ أَوْ شَحْوَ قَوِيَتْ مَرَضُ وَإِنْ حَسَلَتْ لَهُ حِكْمَةٌ وَمَوْعِذَةٌ كَانَتْ مِنْ أَسْبَابِ سَلَاحِهِ وَشِفَائِهِ He said, so when the heart is approached with a doubt or a desire, when the heart is approached with a doubt or a desire, the disease or the illness of that heart becomes stronger. When the heart is approached with a doubt or desire, the illness will become stronger. Then what is he said? But when an admonition or a reminder takes place, this will be the reason for the rectification and the cure for the heart. When an admonishment or, or knowledge takes place, this is the reason for the rectification and the cure of the heart. So we understand that there's no doubt that the heart is going to be approached. The heart is going to be approached with that which harms it in terms of desires and in terms of doubts. 
But if an admonition or reminder comes, this would rectify the heart and this would cure the heart. Likewise, it was said by Imam Ibn Qayyim, the student of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, in his book, Iraathat al-Lahfan, he says, وَكَذَلْكَ الْغَمُّ وَالْحَمُّ وَالْحُزْنُ أَمْرَادٌ لِلْقُلُوبِ He said, anxiety, worry, and grief are all diseases of the heart. Anxiety, worry, and grief are all diseases of the heart. And he said, وَالشِّفَاءُهَا بِأَضْضَادِهَا And the cure for anxiety, worry, and grief is that you do that which is the opposite. Is that you do that which is the opposite. مِنَ الْفَرَحِ وَالسُّرُورِ By bringing about what makes you happy and what brings comfort. What makes you happy and what brings comfort. So the believer has to focus on that. The believer has to give attention to that. Notice what Allah Azawajal says in the Quran, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَتْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ Indeed, with the remembrance of Allah, do the hearts find comfort. Indeed, in the remembrance of Allah, do the hearts find comfort. So the believer, as you live in this life, and you understand and acknowledge that your heart is approached with things that make it weak, with things that make it sick, with things that even make your heart die, you have to, you have to acknowledge that, and then you have to work, like Sheikh Abdurrahman al-Sa'adi said, to remove that which brings about the illness, the sickness, the grief, the anxiety, and the worry, and to replace it with that which brings life to, to replace it with that which brings life to your heart. And likewise, so the next, likewise as it relates to the benefits of this affair, notice once again where he said, the decisive means that result in happiness, the removal of anxiety and worry, so that one, notice what he said, put a line under it. To remove what brings about anxiety and worry. So that's, so you're working to remove it. After you what? After you acknowledge it. After you realize that there are things, you shouldn't just think that, you know, you're a strong Muslim. Alhamdulillah, I'm strong. I'm, I'm thabit upon my religion. No, you should worry. You should understand that there are things that affect you. There are things that harm you. There are things that make you weak. So you work to remove those things. And then you strive to replace it with that which does the opposite. You strive to replace it with that which does the opposite. As our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, on the authority of Anas, and this is the second point, that our beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to seek refuge in Allah from these things. Just like the Prophet وسلم, used to seek refuge in Allah from hypocrisy and from kufr and from shirk. Yani he seek refuge in Allah. The Prophet وسلم, used to seek refuge in Allah from anxiety, from grief, from worry. You had in Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari, Afwan Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, on the authority of Anas bin Malik, عنه, that he said that the Prophet وسلم, used to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-huzni wal-ajzi wal-kasli wal-bukhli wal-jubni wal-dali'i al-dayni wa ghalabat al-rijal That Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to seek refuge in Allah from worry, grief, anxiety, inability like not having the ability to do something kasl from laziness, right? Wal bukhli, being selfish. Wal jubni, being a coward and not being strong or courageous. Likewise, the Prophet وسلم, the humiliation of debt. The Prophet وسلم, used to seek refuge in Allah from being in debt. Wa ghalabat rijal, being conquered by other men. Being conquered by men. So our beloved Messenger وسلم, just like he used to seek refuge in Allah from the hellfire and the likes, the Prophet وسلم, used to seek refuge in Allah from worry, from grief, from anxiety. So it's not something that's noble for the believers to remain in a state of worry, anxiety. It's not something noble. It's not something recommended. 
A person shouldn't believe that if he remains in a state of anxiety and grief and worry, that he's getting closer to Allah. No, it's something that the Prophet used to seek refuge in Allah from. Likewise, you had in the Muslim of Imam Ahmed, and it's declared Hassan by Shaykh al Bani, with the Prophet on the authority of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, that he said that the Prophet said, Ma asaba ahad qat hammun wala huznun faqala Allahumma inni abduk ibn abduk ibn amatik nasiyati biyadik madin fiya hukmuk adlun fiya qadaok as aduka bi kulli ismin huwa lak sammayta bihi nafsak aw alamtahu ahadan min khalq to the end of the hadith and we'll translate it. That Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu said that a believer is not afflicted. No believer is afflicted with worry and anxiety. And he says, O oh Allah, I am, your, I am your servant. I am the son of your servant. And he, my father. I am the son of your female servant. Yani my mother. My reins are in your hands. Your decree will take place upon me. I ask you by every name that you have named yourself or you've taught anyone from your creation or you've sent down in a book or you've kept to yourself that I ask you to make the Quran the pure or the, the cool cleanliness of my heart Rabi Aqalbi like the light the light rain I ask you to make the light rain uh, uh, or to make my heart like this light, or to fill my heart with this light rain. وَنُورَ sadri And the light of my chest. And that which takes away my difficulty, and that which takes away my worry. The point of this hadith, and you can look for the exact translation of it. <laughs> the point of this hadith is that the Prophet wasallam informed his companions and taught his companions that if they have worry or grief or anxiety, they should say this dua. They should say this dua. They should call on Allah Azza wa Jal and call on Allah by His names and ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make the Quran this nice, this nice rain of their heart and the, no, the, the light of their chest and that which takes away their worry. Right? What did the Prophet Sallallahu say? وَذِحَابَ hammi, And to remove my worry and anxiety. And the person that does it, what did the Prophet say? إِلَّا أَذْحَبَ اللَّهُ حَمَّهُ وَحُزْنَهُ وَأَبْدَلَ لَهُ مَكَانَهُ فَرَحًا Whoever says this dua, whoever says this dua, Allah will take away his anxiety, Allah will take away his worry, and Allah will replace it with happiness. Allah would replace, replace it with happiness. Then one of the companions said, Ya Rasulullah, ala nata'allamuha? One of the companions said, Ya Rasulullah, should we not memorize this supplication? The Prophet Sallallahu said, Bala yambagi liman sami'aha an yata'allamaha. Indeed, you should. Anyone that hears this dua, they should memorize it. They should memorize it and do what? They should use it. They should use it. So this likewise, as we're going to read, this informs of the way of the believer is that if you have difficulty or anxiety or grief or worry, one of the first things that you should do is make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. You should make dua to Allah that Allah removes it. That Allah Azza wa Jal removes it because it remaining is not something that's going to benefit you in any way. The remainder or the fact that anxiety or worry or grief stays in the believer is not something getting him closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. It's not something getting him closer to Allah Azza wa Jal as we're going to read from the statements of the Salaf. Then he says, then he says, after he says striving to eliminate the causes of anxiety, then he says, and to attain the means that bring about happiness. So the next thing that you do is that you have to do something to bring about happiness. And notice in this hadith of Abdullah bin Mas'ud 
Notice in this hadith that the Prophet wasallam said, whoever makes this dua, Allah would remove the anxiety and grief and Allah would replace it with happiness. Allah would replace it with happiness. So the believer does not become complacent and remain in a state of grief. He doesn't. Because the Prophet wasallam encouraged that even though we have gone through a trial of tribulation, it's upon the believer to supplicate that Allah brings him happiness. That Allah Azawajal brings him happiness. So the believer does not remain in that state. Then, so that's one thing, to make dua. And we're going to mention about that. So that's to, to do, th do the things that attain the means of happiness. It's upon you to do things that bring about happiness. One of the things... One of the things that would bring happiness to the believer after a calamity and the likes is for him to realize the very fact that he has had a calamity, if he's patient with that calamity, that it would be a means of expiation for him. It would be a means of expiation. Once again, not that he wants the calamity to continue so he's not happy with grief or anxiety or the likes. The calamity has happened. But now he's patient and he understands that because of the calamity and with him responding with patience, Allah is going to remove some of his deeds, his bad deeds. Allah Azawajal is going to remove some of his bad deeds. As you have in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim on the authority of Abu Sayyid al-Khudri and Abu Huraira. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Ma yusibu al-mu'min min wasab, wala nasab, wala ham, wala huzn, wala gham, hatta shouka yushakuha illa kafir Allahu biha min khatayahu." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that no one is afflicted with calamity, or poverty, or anxiety, or sadness or fear, even the prick of a thorn, a thorn harming the believer, except that Allah Azza wa Jal would make it an expiation for his sins. So the fact that you have been afflicted with something that has caused anxiety or worry, if you're patient with it, it will be a means of expiation. There's even a hadith there's even a hadith, and this is for us to put trials and tribulations in their proper perspective. There's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that Allah Azza wa Jal wants, and I'm paraphrasing it, I'm not reading it, that Allah Azza wa Jal wants the believer to get to a higher part in Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the believer to get to a higher part in Jannah. But the believer is not doing enough acts of worship to get him to that place in Jannah that Allah wants for him. His acts of worship, whether his daily prayers or his fasting, it's not enough. But Allah Azza wa Jal wants him to get to a higher place. So Allah gives him trials and tribulations. And if he's patient with those trials and tribulations, Allah will raise him in levels. Allah Azza wa Jal would raise him in levels. So a trial and a tribulation is not to break you. A trial and a tribulation is to raise you. If only the believer would show patience. If only the believer would show patience. Likewise, it's upon us to understand that it's possible a trial and tribulation is an indication that Allah Azza wa Jal wants good for us. Yes. If Allah wants good for you, He gives him tribulations. As you had in the hadith reported in Tirmidhi and declared authentic by Shaykh al-Albani rahmatullahi alayhi on the authority of Anas bin Malik that he said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِعَبْدِهِ خَيْرًا عَجَّلَ لَهُ الْعُقُوبَةَ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَإِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِعَبْدِهِ الشَّرْ my dear brothers and sisters, listen to this hadith to, for us to realize 
that it's possible a trial and tribulation was placed in front of us for our good. The Prophet ﷺ said, if Allah wants good for the individual, if Allah wants good for you, Allah gives you the punishment in this life. Allah gives you, you've done something wrong. You've done something wrong. But if Allah wants good for you, even though you've done something wrong, Allah gives you a calamity as a means of expiation for that sin. So that is, if you're patient, khalas. Allah gave you your punishment for it. Allah gave you your punishment. But then the Prophet ﷺ said, but if Allah wants bad for you, Allah doesn't give you the He doesn't give you the calamity in this life. He doesn't give you the punishment in this life. He waits to give you the punishment in the next life. So my dear brothers, those who are in front of me, my dear brothers, is the punishment of the dunya worse or the punishment of the hereafter? The punishment of the hereafter. So if an individual does something wrong, wronged himself, if an individual wronged himself, would you prefer that Allah punishes you in this life or the next life? This life. The way Allah punishes you with trials and tribulations to clean your slate in this life so you don't have to deal with it in the next life. So the calamity is not something to break you. It's not something to throw you off of your religion. The calamity is because you have faults and Allah Azza wa wants good for you so he gives it to you in this life so you don't have to stand for it on next life, in the next life. So you don't have to receive that punishment in the next life. Likewise, also in Tirmidhi, on Anas bin Malik, another hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ al ma al bala, wa inna Allah ta'ala idha ahabba qawman ibtalahum. Verily, the recompense or what you get is according to what, you do, you, what you've done. What you get is according to what you've done. And when Allah loves a person, He will test that individual. When Allah loves you, He will test that individual. Then the Prophet said, فَمَنْ رَدِيَ فَلَهُ الرِّضَى وَمَنْ سَخَتَ فَلَهُ سَخَتْ So whoever's pleased with it, then he, he's pleased with it. But whoever is angry, upon him is that. It doesn't harm Allah in any way. The point is for us to understand, the point is for us to understand that when we have a calamity, it's possible that that calamity is because of something that you have done. وَمَا أَصَابَتْكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٍ Allah says in the Quran, whatever has afflicted you, is because of what your hands have put forward. And Allah pardons much. Allah pardons much. So the calamity or the trial that has befallen you, it, it's possible that it's because of a sin that you have done. And because of Allah showing mercy upon you, He's giving you the punishment in this life. He doesn't want you to have to stand for it in the next life. Another thing... Another thing that helps a believer, as Shaykh Abdul Rahman al Saadi said, to obtain the means that bring about happiness. Another thing that helps the believer obtain the means to bring about happiness is to realize the trials and the tribulations that you are afflicted with in this life, you will forget them on the day of judgment. You will forget them, Afwan, in the next life. Every single trial and tribulation, the believer, every single trial and tribulation, every single difficulty, in the next life you will forget it. It will be as if it never happened. You had the hadith in Sahih Muslim, also on the authority of Anas bin Malik, that he said, that the Prophet ﷺ said, يُؤْتَى بِأَنْأَمِّ أَحْلِ الدُّنْيَا مِنْ أَحْلِ النَّارِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ that the Prophet ﷺ is describing two people. He said, the person who had the most comfort in this dunya, the person who had the most comfort in this dunya, 
comfort and ease and luxury. But he's a disbeliever. He will be brought forward on the day of judgment. He will be brought forward on the day of judgment. فَيُصْبَغُ فِي النَّارِ سَبْغَةً ثُمَّ يُقَالُ يَبْنَ آدَمْ هَلْ رَأَيْتَ خَيْرٌ قَدْ هَلْ مَرَّ بِكَ نَعِيمٌ قَدْ فَيَقُولُ لَا وَاللَّهِ مَا رَأَيْتُ خَيْرٌ قَدْ فَيَقُولُ لَا وَاللَّهِ يَا رَبْ So once again, this individual who is very comfortable, he has luxuries, he has ease, he doesn't have any difficulties, but he's a disbeliever. On the day of judgment, he would be brought and he would be dipped into the hellfire one time. One time dipped into the hellfire. And then he would be removed and it is said to him, have you ever had any comfort? Have you ever had any trials in your life? He said, I never had any of one. Have you ever had any comfort or luxury? He said, no, I never had any comfort and luxury. Now, who is this? This is an individual who was most comfor comfortable in this dunya. No trials, no tribulations, absolute luxury. But on Yom Al-Qiyamah, because he was a disbeliever, he's dipped into the hellfire one time. And then he's asked, you had any comfort? He said, no, I never had comfort. Why? One dip in the hellfire made him forget all of the comfort that he had in this dunya. One dip in the hellfire. Not thrown in the hellfire. A dip in the hellfire. Fine. Now the next person, the Prophet said, وَيُقْتَعَ بِأَشَدِّ النَّاسِ بُعْسًا فِي الدُّنْيَا مِنْ أَحْلِ الْجَنَّةِ Then, the people who had the most difficulty in this life, trials, tribulations, anxiety, worry, but they are believers. On Yawm Al-Qiyamah, they would be dipped, once again, this is the person that is a believer, and he has trials and tribulations and difficulty. So much so the Prophet said, وَيُؤْتَى بِأَشَدِّ النَّاسِ بُعْسًا An individual who had the most difficulties. The most, not that he had some difficulty, he had the most difficulties. He had the most discomfort. He will be brought on Yawm Qiyamah and he's a believer. And he's dipped in Jinnah once. Dipped. Not thrown, not, not allowed to walk into Jinnah. He's dipped into Jinnah. And then he's removed, and it is said to him, "Yabna Adam, hal ra'ayta bu'san qat, wa hal marra bika shidda tunqat, fa yaqulu wallahi ya Rabb, ma marra bi bu'san qat, wa ma ra'aytu shidda tunqat." He, when he's brought out, is said to him, "Have you ever had any difficulties? Have you ever had any discomfort?" He would say, "My Lord, I never had difficulties or discomfort." I never experienced any difficulties or discomfort. My dear brothers, he was dipped into Jinnah one time. He was dipped into Jinnah one time. One time, dipped, being dipped into Jinnah made him forget about all of his trials and tribulations. So that's an encouragement for the believer. Trials and tribulations are not to break you. Trials and tribulations are not to make you fall back on your feet. Trials and tribulations are not to make you fall out of the religion. Trials and tribulations can elevate you. If an individual is patient, if an individual turns to Allah, if an individual supplicates to Allah Azza wa Jal. Moving on, what does he say in the next paragraph? This is attained by forgetting about the past misfortunes that cannot be averted nor altered, and by understanding that overthinking about these things is foolish and pointless. It is actually stupidity and insanity. Continue. Stop, stop, sorry. So what he says, he says, so one of the ways that you obtain, one of the ways that you obtain, oh, one of the ways that you eliminate the causes of worry, anxiety, and grief, and you attain that which brings about happiness, is by you forgetting about the past misfortunes. Because those things could have not been averted. Those things could have not been averted. It's, it's in the past. So it's not for the believer 
and it's not from intelligence and it's not from sound intellect that you stay in the past. It happened already. It happened already. There's nothing that you can do to change the past. So from sound intellect is that you don't worry about the past. So some advice for that is that one, the believer submits to the decree of Allah. Al-Qadha wal-Qadr. The believer submits to the decree of Allah. It's in the past. There's nothing you can do to change what has already happened. That is from the qada and the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. As Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al-Hadid, as Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al-Hadid, verse 22, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ نَبْرَأَهَا إِنَّ ذَلَكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al-Hadid, Nothing takes place of difficulty in the, in the world or in yourself except that it is in a book before it happens. Except that it is in a book before it happens. And this is easy for Allah. So that's what Allah says in Surah Al-Hadid. Everything that takes place outside and everything that takes place with you it is already written that it would happen. So you submit to that. You believe in qada wal qadr. Because if you constantly stay in the past, that means you're questioning the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal. Why did it happen to me? How could it happen to me? So from the belief of the believer is the belief in qada. With the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Jibreel Alayhi Salatu Wasallam asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about Iman, the Prophet said to believe in Allah, to believe in his messengers, the prophets, the angels, his books, and to believe in divine decree. So you don't stay in the past because if you stay in the past, you begin to question yourself. How could it happen to me? Why did it happen to me? I don't deserve this and the likes. So the believer does not remain in the past. Allah says in Surah Al-Hadid, nothing takes place in the world nor in you except that it is in the book before it happens. Then the next verse, what does Allah say? لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَهُ بِمَا أَصَابَكُمْ بِمَا أَتَاكُمْ لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَهُ بِمَا أَتَاكُمْ بِمَا أَتَاكُمْ Allah Azza wa Jal says, so that you do not have grief over what missed you عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَهُ بِمَا أَتَاكُمْ and you're not happy and we'll explain that. So one thing is you don't have grief for that which missed you. And the second thing, you're not overly zealous and prideful for what came to you. Why? Because it came to you because Allah wanted it for you. But the first, what does Allah say? So you don't have worry and grief about that which missed you. So if something for example, you were trying to find a job, you were trying to gain some worldly benefit, and it missed you. So the believer shouldn't sit there. Why? Why didn't I get it? Why wasn't I able to accomplish it? So you don't have grief and worry about something that missed you. Why? It wasn't written for you. It wasn't written for you. Likewise, you don't have this, over, uh, this overly joy, you know, joy about the things that you accomplish. Why? You're happy, indeed. You're happy. But you don't think that it's from you. You realize that it's from who? Allah. It's from Allah Azza wa Jal. So even, so one, whatever misses you, you say, Allah didn't write it for me. And whatever comes to you, you say, Alhamdulillah, Allah gave it to me. So in both cases, you return it to who? You return it to Allah Azza wa Jal. In both cases, you return it to Allah Azza wa Jal. Hafidh ibn Kathir, rahmatullahi alayhi, he said, This verse means, A'lamnakum bi taqaddam ilmina wa sabqi kitabatina lil ashya qabla qawniha wa taqdirina al kainat qabla wujudiha li ta'lamu anna ma asabakum lam yakun li yukhti'ukum wa ma aqta'akum lam yakun li yusibukum. 
Hafid ibn Kathir said in his tafsir of these verses of Surah Al-Hadid, he said, this verse is Allah saying to you, we are informing you that we have decreed everything. Allah in Surah Al-Hadid is informing you, I've decreed everything before it happens. I've decreed it so that you know for certainty whatever comes to you, it was not meant to miss you. And whatever misses you, it was not meant to come to you. So the believer knows that with certainty. So the believer knows that with certainty. The believer doesn't ask, doesn't question the past. Why didn't I get it? Why didn't it happen to me? Why did this happen to me? Why did that happen to me? No, the believer doesn't question it. Whatever comes to him, he says, As the Prophet ﷺ taught us, you say, Allah decrees and what he wills takes place. So the believer submits to it. The believer submits to it. Likewise, you had a hadith on the authority of Ubad ibn Samit. And once again, we're still talking about belief in divine decree. Where Ubad ibn Samit radiallahu anhu said to his son, Ya ibni, he said, Ya Bunayya, Afwan, he said, Ya Bunayya, he said, Oh my son, this is a companion teaching his son. He said, Ya Bunayya, innaka lan tajid ta'am al hakikat al iman. He said, You will not find the sweetness or the taste of faith. Afwan, you will not find the true taste of faith. Hatta ta'lam anna ma asabaka lam yakun li yukti'uk. وَمَا أَقْطَعَكَ لَمْ يَكُنْ يُصِيبُكَ So Ubad ibn Samit said to his son, which is important that we teach our children and we teach our families. Notice what he's teaching his son. He's saying, oh my son, you will not obtain or taste the taste or obtain the taste of, of the reality of faith until you know for certainty whatever befalls you was not meant to miss you. And whatever misses you was not meant to befall you. Whatever took place, it was not meant to befall you. It was not meant to miss you, and whatever missed you was not meant to befall you. Then he said, he continuing, he said, Sumir to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ubad ibn Samir is saying, I heard the messenger say, that the Prophet said when Allah created the pen, he said to the pen, write. The pen said, What should I write? Allah said, Write everything that would take place until the day of judgment. What did Ubad ibn Samad say to his son? يا بني إني سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من مات على غير هذا فليس مني. I heard my I heard the prophet say whoever dies without believing in this, he is not from me. He is not from me. Whoever dies, not believing in divine decree, questioning divine decree, why, how. If you die upon that state, you're not from the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look how Ubad ibn Samit radiallahu anhu is advising his son. You have to believe in divine decree. And indeed, when you believe in divine decree, alhamdulillah, you submit to it. You don't remain in a state of anxiety. You don't remain in a state of sadness and the likes. And we mentioned the hadith already. We mentioned the hadith already that the Prophet ﷺ used to seek refuge in Allah from grief and worry and sadness. Right? Imam Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, he said a wonderful, a wonderful benefit of seeking refuge in Allah from that. And he mentioned this in his book, Tariq al Hijratain. Imam Ibn Qayyim, he said, he said, Al-Huznu, to make us understand the dangers of remaining in a state of grief and worry. He said, فَالْحُزْنُ مَرَضٌ مِنْ أَمْرَادِ الْقَلْبِ يَمْنَعُهُ مِنْ نُحُودِهِ 
وَسَيْرِهِ وَتَشْمِيرِهِ He said, Sadness and anxiety is a disease of the heart. It stops your heart from standing up and from continuing and from progressing. When you remain in a state of sadness and anxiety, you're stopping yourself from being productive. You're stopping yourself from worshiping Allah. You're stopping yourself from being active. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's why our beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to seek refuge in Allah because there's no good in it. There's no good in it. Then he says, he says, بَلْ أَلَّذِي Further on, he says, بَلْ أَلَّذِي يَنْفَعُهُ أَنْ يَسْتَقْبِلِ السَّيْرِ وَيُجِدْ وَيُشَمِّرْ what is going to benefit you is that you continue. So notice what Shaykh Abdurrahman al-Sa'ad said. You don't think about the past. He said, forget about the past. Because when you think about the past, it's just going to keep you back. When you think about the past, it's just going to keep you back. But rather, you have to be diligent and think about the future. Continue your path. Continue your journey. Even Shaykh Abdurrahman uh, Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, and because of time we'll translate it directly into English, he said the example of this individual, someone who just allows his worry and grief to keep him back. The example of this individual is an individual, and like I said, I'll just say it in English to uh, save some time, an individual that was on a journey. An individual that was on a journey. And alhamdulillah, these type of examples, they, 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 they make us visualize what he's trying to say. An individual is on a journey with a group of his companions. Everyone with me? An individual is on a journey with a group of his companions. While he's on that journey, he loses his companions. Let's say he stayed behind to do something and they left him. Right? So now he's by himself. He's alone. He's lonely. He's worried. Is it going to benefit him to sit and think about him losing his companions? Or is it going to benefit him to keep walking to try to catch up to them? Which one? Keep walking. It doesn't benefit you to sit there and think about, I lost my companions. I'm lonely. I'm lost without them. What am I going to do without my companions? Yeah, get up and walk. So Imam Ibn Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi, he says that's worry and anxiety and grief. You've, come on, something's happened. A trial, a calamity, something has happened. Are you going to sit there and just think about it? Or are you going to get on your feet and continue? That's the example of an individual as it relates to trials and tribulations. Now, continue. He must struggle against his heart to prevent it from thinking about these affairs. He must also struggle against his heart to prevent it from worrying about what he foresees for the future, like poverty, fear, and other afflictions, which he imagines will befall him in the future. He should know that the outcomes of the future are unknown, whether good or bad, or hopes or pains. He should know that all of this is in the hand of the Almighty, the All-Wise. The servant has no control over any of this. And the only thing he can do is strive to attain the good and repel the evil. No. So the individual struggles against his heart to prevent it from thinking about these affairs. What's going to happen? The past. And likewise, worry about the future. So worrying about the past and worrying about the future. And that's why Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahmatullah alayhi, he mentions the, the difference between the two, actually, um, as it relates to ham wal huzn where he said, Rahmatullahi alayhi, the difference between the two. He says, if it's something that has passed, it brings about grief. Something that has passed, it brings about grief. And if it's something that's coming in the future, it brings about worry. It brings about worry. So the past is grief, and the future is worry. Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi he mentioned or Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah he said in his book 
al istiqama he said naha rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an al irstirsal ma'a al qadr bidun al hirs ala fi'l al ma'mur alladhi yanfa'u al 'abd shaykh al islam ibn taymiyyah he said that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has forbid the muslim for sitting there and thinking about qadr why did it happen how could it happen or the future what's going to happen what if this happens what if that happens the individual doesn't worry about that why imam al-sa'di said because you don't know what's going to happen in the future that's in the hands of allah azawajal so if it's in the hands of allah turn to allah ask allah for the best of it as we're going to see in the dua ask allah for the best of it so shaykh al-islam ibn taymiyyah said that the Prophet ﷺ forbid the individual from deeply thinking about divine decree and not doing that which benefits you. Not doing that which benefits you. Instead of thinking, it's upon you to act. Dua, righteous deeds, protecting yourself. That's what's in your hands. To make dua. To perform righteous deeds. To do the best to protect yourself. But what's going to happen is not in your hands. That's with Allah Azza wa Jal. That's with Allah Azza wa Jal. And because of that, <coughs> Imam Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi he mentioned in Mudarij al-Salikin, in another one of his books, where he said, when Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Fatiha, and this is very important, when Allah says in Surah Al-Fatiha, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ it is you we worship, and it is you we seek your, your assistance. He said, so as it relates to sadness, grief, anxiety, and the likes, he says, لَيْسَتْ مِنَ الْمَنَازِلَ الْمَطْلُوبَ وَلَا مَأْمُورِ بِنُزُولِهَا It is not from the, 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 the praiseworthy or the noble characteristics that a person remains in a state of sadness and grief. It's not. Nor did Allah tell you to be like this. Nor did Allah Azza wa Jal tell you to be like this. He said, further on, he says, وَلَمْ يَأْتِي الْحُزْنُ فِي الْقُرْآنِ إِلَّا مَنْ هِيًّا عَنْهُ أَوْ مَنْ فِيًّا Sadness, grief, and worry, it only came in the Qur'an that Allah is saying, do not do it, or that Allah removed it. There's two ways it came in the Qur'an. Allah removed it from people, or Allah said, do not. An example of Allah saying, do not, where Allah, in the previous verse in Surah Al-Hadid, do not become worried. So Allah is telling us, don't become worried. Right? وَلَا تَحْزَنْ عَلَيْهِمْ Don't worry about them and the likes. So we find that Allah Azza wa Jal either told us not to do it, or Allah Azza wa Jal informed that he removed it. Like from the people of Jinnah, Allah removed it from them. As they say in the Quran, Alhamdulillah alladhi adhaba anna al hazal. All praise be to Allah. In Surah Al Fatir, the people of Jinnah, they say, All praise be to Allah who has removed the grief and the worry from us. So, grief and worry in the Quran, either Allah orders you not to be that way, or Allah informs that He has removed it from the people. Then what the Shaykh Ibn Qayyim said. He said, وَسِرُّ ذَلِكْ أَنَّ الْحُزْنَ مُوْقِفٌ غَيْرُ مُسَيِّرْ وَلَا مَصْلَحَةَ فِيهِ لِلْقَلْبِ Pay attention, my dear brothers. He said, the inner reason or the justification why Allah has mentioned sadness, grief, or worry of the likes in the Qur'an and He's ordered you not to be that way or he's informed you that he's removed it is because it is something that stops you. It is something that prevents you. It is something that hinders you. And there's no benefit for the heart. Allahu Akbar. Notice what he says. There's no wala maslahata fihi lil qalb. There's no benefit for the heart to remain in this state. Then what does he say? وَأَحَبُّ شَيْءٍ إِلَى الشَّيْطَانِ أَنْ يَحْزِنَ الْعَبْدِ 
ليقطعه عن سيره ويوقفه عن سلوكه he said and the most beloved thing to the shaitan is to make you worry the most beloved thing to the shaitan is to make you worry because when he makes you worry he stops you from your journey he prevents you from your journey notice that so he wants to make you worried he wants to you to busy yourself with the past why because if a person and we, we know that we can visualize it if an individual is walking on a path and he's diligent he's trying to race toward Allah as Allah says race towards forgiveness for your Lord if an individual is walking forward the shaitan wants him to stop no look back turn around what did you do why did that happen how could that happen if you do that how are you going to ever get forward so Ibn Qayyim said وَأَحَبُّ شَيْءٍ إِلَى الشَّيْطَانِ أَنْ يَحْزَنَ الْعَبْدِ لِيَقْتَعَهُ عَنْ سَيْرِهِ وَيُقِفُهُ عَنْ سُلُوكِهِ So the most beloved thing to the shaitan is to make you sad, to make you worried, to make you anxious, to cut you off from your journey, to stop you from your journey. Then what does he say? Rahmatullahi alayhi وَقَدْ اسْتَعَاذَ مِنْهُ No. So he said, وَقَدْ اسْتَعَاذَ مِنْهُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمُ And verily, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to seek refuge in Allah from this. Verily, the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم used to seek refuge in Allah from this. Why? Because it makes, it, it stops you from your journey. It stops you from your journey. Further on, he says, وَكِلَاهُمَا يُضْعِفُ الْقَلْبِ مُضْعِفٌ لِلْقَلْبِ عَنِ السَّيْرِ وَمُقَتِّرٌ لِلْعَزْمِ He said, worry and grief, both of them weaken your heart. And they stop you from having the firm intention to continue. Both of them. Worry and grief. Worry and grief, they are that which weakens your heart. And they stop you from your journey. Now, I'm continue. The servant should know that when he stops his mind from worrying about the future and instead relies upon his Lord to rectify these affairs and trust him concerning this, when he does this, his heart will be content, his affairs will be in order, and his anxiety and worry will vanish. Allahu Akbar. So when the servant, so he says the servant should know that when he stops his mind from worrying about the future and instead relies upon his Lord to rectify these affairs and trust him concerning this, when he does this, his heart will be content. When he does this, his heart will be content. Yani, when he stops thinking about the past, right? When he stops thinking about the past, likewise, he's not worried about the future. His heart will be content if it's connected to Allah Azza wa Jal. If it's connected to Allah Azza wa Jal. Not just merely him stopping thinking about the past, and worrying about the future. No, he has to connect his heart to Allah Azza wa Jal. And he put his, his affairs with Allah Azza wa Jal because he knows that Allah controls the affairs. Allah controls the affairs. And he, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There's no change and there's no might except with Allah. There's no change nor any might except with Allah Azza wa Jal. So why should I worry about the past? It's happened already. And why should I worry and have anxiety about the future, but rather I put my affairs in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. And we've been taught in Islam, we've been taught in Islam to put our affairs in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. As we, for example, in Salat al-Istikhara, what's the purpose of Salat al-Istikhara? That the companions said, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يعلمنا Salat al-Istikhara كما يعلمنا السورة من القرآن. The Prophet Sallallahu used to teach us istikhara like he used to teach us a surah from the Qur'an. We recite surahs every day. So the Prophet Sallallahu used to seek, used to teach the Sahaba to recite or to make Salat al-Istikhara. Why? Because you're asking Allah for the future. You're asking Allah Azza wa for the future. So the individual doesn't worry about it. 
He puts it with Allah Azza wa Jal and he puts his dependency upon Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. The next part. How much time do we have left? We'll finish it because uh, I think the time it will finish it quickly. Okay. Yeah. Time. Sucker. Traffic. Supplication of the Prophet. Amongst the most effective means to prepare for future affairs is implementing the supplication that the Prophet used to say. Allahumma aslih li deeni ladi huwa ismu to envy, wa aslih li dunya ladi fiha maaji, wa aslih li akhirati ladi fiha maadi, wa jari hayata ziyada than li fi kulli khayr, wa jari nota waha than li min kulli shah. O Allah, rectify my religion, which is the safeguard of all my affairs. Rectify for me my worldly affairs and which is my livelihood. And rectify for me my hereafter which is my afterlife. Make life a further means for me for all that is good and death an alleviation from all that is evil. Okay. So here, to accomplish what he previously mentioned, what the Shaykh Rahmatullahi Alayhi previously mentioned about the believer not being having grief about the past and likewise not having anxiety about the future one of the things that would help the believer accomplish that is to make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal to make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal and he mentions a specific dua and we'll explain that dua so one of the greatest things that helps a believer as it relates to as it relates to not having anxiety, not having anxiety about the future, is du'a and remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it's ajib that some of us we go through trials and we go through tribulations and we go through difficulties. And then when we ask an individual, how many supplications of the Prophet have you memorized and you use? You find many of us don't know many at all. So, my dear brother and sister, if Allah continues to test you with trials and tribulations why have you not implemented what the Prophet ﷺ has given us as a means of as a means of rectification take time to learn those dua the previous dua that we mentioned where the Prophet ﷺ said whoever is afflicted with a trial and tribulation they should say this dua Allahumma inni abduk ibn abduk ibn amatik so the Prophet taught his companions to say this dua then the companion said, Ya Rasulullah, should we memorize it? The Prophet said, it is befitting for anyone who hears this dua to memorize it and to say it. So you hear brothers and sisters, may Allah guide us all, going through calamity after calamity after calamity. And some of us, may Allah make us strong on his path, have become weak because of those calamities. But we haven't taken it upon ourselves to say and memorize those supplications. To say and memorize those supplications. So how do we want Allah Azza wa Jal to change our affairs where we haven't actively done something to change our own affairs? We haven't done what we need to change our own affairs. One of the greatest things that a believer can do to rectify his affairs is dua. Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi said in his book, and it should be in everyone's library at da'wa dawa the disease and the cure it should be in every muslim home whether in arabic or english and every muslim family should read from it and study it one of the best books that has ever been written on the diseases of the heart the diseases of the limbs and the cure at da'wa dawa the disease and the cure Imam Ibn Qayyim Rahma book He says وَكَذَلِكَ الدُّعَى فَإِنَّهُ مِنْ أَقْوَى أَقْوَى الْأَسْبَابِ فِي دَفْعِ الْمَقْرُوحِ وَحُصُولِ الْمَطْلُوبِ He said Just like supplication It is from the strongest means Of preventing harm And obtaining good Or from the strongest means To prevent harm and to obtain good is what? Supplication. Is supplication. 
But then he says something which is very important. You can refer back to it in English because the book is translated and it's available, Jazakumullah khairan, those who are responsible for bringing it to the Islamic library. Ibn Qayyim says about dua, because there's some of us, we go through trials and tribulations and we make dua, but we don't see the, the result. We don't see the outcome. We, we don't see anything change. Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi and I strongly encourage our brothers and sisters to go back to that book and to study it and to read it and to take their time. He says, وَلَكِنْ قَدْ يَتَخَلَّفْ عَنْهُ أَثَرُهُ It's possible you make dua, but you do not see the results. Why? Why? He says, إِمَّا لِضَعْفِهِ فِي نَفْسِهِ Either the dua you're making is weak. The dua you're making is weak. And he explains that it's possible it's a dua that's not, that Allah Azza wa Jal is not pleased with. Maybe there's the way you're making the dua, Allah is not pleased with it. Something you're saying in the dua is harmful. Right? That's one reason. Or your heart is weak and it's not truly engaged when you're making the dua. So my dear brother and sister, it's possible that some of us have been making dua for something, but you are the cause that it hasn't been answered. You are the cause that it hasn't been answered because your heart is weak. What are some of the things? And you can read the book. You can read the book for extra benefit. Your heart is weak. How? It's possible, because keep in mind, my dear brothers, we're talking about the affairs of the heart. If you have a love for the sin and you're making dua for Allah to rectify, so you're making dua with your tongue, but your heart loves sin. So you're preventing Allah from answering your dua. You're preventing Allah Azza wa Jal from answering your dua because Allah Azza wa Jal knows what's in your heart. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala knows what's in your heart. So you have a love for sin. You're making dua, it's not being answered. Or, you don't truly feel that Allah will answer your dua. You don't truly feel that Allah will answer your dua. So you're making dua to Allah, but your heart is not engaged. Your heart is not engaged. So this is another thing. This is another thing that prevents the dua from being answered. The dua is correct. The du'a is correct itself, and the du'a is a cure itself. But because your heart, where the du'a should come from, yani, du'a should come from our hearts, not just from our tongues. Du'a should come from our hearts, not just from our tongues. Right? Why, did, why do we say that? Ibn Qayyim said, it's like the example of, an bow, of a bow and an arrow. You with me? The example of a bow and an arrow. If the arrow is strong, right? If the arrow is strong, but the bow is weak, can a weak bow make and you know shoot a strong arrow? What's the answer? No. Even if the arrow is strong, but the bow is weak, the arrow is not going to go very far. And if it does go far, it's not going to penetrate. It's not going to penetrate the target. Why? Because the bow is weak. So Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi said, so when an individual, so when an individual makes dua and his heart is not engaged, then it's like an individual shooting a strong arrow from a weak bow. So you are the reason why your dua is not being accepted. You are the reason why your dua is not being accepted. And then he goes on to mention other reasons about uh, negligence and the likes. But the point of what we're saying is, it's, we're good? The point of what we're saying, it's very important for the individual that the dua that you make comes from your heart. And dua is one of the strongest things to prevent harm.
referred to Surah Al-Anbiya where Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned about his, prophet, about his prophets wa ayyub if nada rabbahu anni masani adur wa anta arham rahimin in Surah Al-Anbiya Allah mentions ayyub that ayyub alayhi salatu salam was afflicted with calamities and he supplicated to Allah Allah says fastajabna lahu fa kashafna ma bihi min dur so we answered his call and we removed his calamity then Allah mentions Ismail and Idris right and the Al-Kifl and Allah mentions the Noon and Allah mentions Zakariya Allah mentioned all of these prophets and messengers that called on Allah Azza wa Jal that called on Allah Azza wa Jal then toward the end Allah Azza wa Jal says إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَحَبًا وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ Allah Azza wa Jal after mentioning several prophets Allah mentioned Ayyub, Allah mentioned Idris, Allah mentioned Ismail, and others, Zakaria and others. Then Allah said, because all of them were calling on Allah. Allah said, they used to race toward good deeds. And they used to call on us in a state of fear and in a state of hope. So Allah Azawajal mentioned that the prophets and the messengers went through difficulties. The prophets and the messengers went through calamities. The prophets and the messengers went through their people calling them liars and storytellers and calling them crazy and insane. And some of their family members went against them and turned against them and the likes. So they would call on Allah Azza wa Jal. So one, Allah Azza wa Jal said, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ They used to, يُسَارِعُونَ They used to be very diligent in doing righteous deeds, one. Very diligent in doing righteous deeds. And they used to call on us. So that tells you when an individual goes through a trial and a calamity, he just doesn't sit. I can't do anything. Why did this happen? He, his mind is not focused on the past or worrying about the future. He's still doing righteous deeds. Because he understands that's going to be a means of rectification. That's going to be a means of rectification. Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Sa'adi said, and in explanation of those verses, he says, لَمَّا ذَكَرَ هَؤُلَاءِ الْأُلْ... uh, الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَالْمُرْسِلِينَ كِلًّا أَوْ كُلًّا عَلَىٰ إِنْفِرَادِهِ أَثْنَى عَلَيْهِمْ He said, when Allah mentioned all of these prophets, each of them individually, mentioned Idris, mentioned Ayyub, mentioned Ismail, mentioned Zakaria, Right? When Allah mentioned all of those prophets individually, then Allah praised all of them. Allah praised all of them. Why did Allah praise all of them? He says, Because they continued to race to do good deeds. They didn't just sit and worry and have grief and anxiety. No, they continued to do righteous deeds. Right? And... So they did not They did not leave off their good deeds Any form of good deed They did not leave it off They did not allow worry, grief and anxiety To stop them on their journey to Allah Then along with that And then they asked Allah from things that benefit their dunya and things that benefit their akhirah. So they did two things. They continued to do good deeds and they turned to Allah Azza wa Jal. They turned to Allah. So they did not allow that which they uh, witnessed of trials and tribulations and difficulties. They did not allow them, they did not allow that to stop them from worshipping Allah, gaining nearness to Allah, and likewise turning to Allah Azza wa Jal for safety and security and success. So here the author mentioned the importance of making dua. The importance of making dua. Likewise, Ibn Qayyim says in another book, Kitab Wa Bil Sayyib, because dua is seeking from Allah and remembrance of Allah. Dua is two things that you're remembering Allah and you're seeking from Allah. He said, Inna dhikrullahi azza wa jal yusahil is sa'ab 
وَيُيَسِّرِ الْعَصِيرِ وَيُخَفِّفَ الْمَشَاكِ He said, Indeed, the remembrance of Allah, dhikr and dua, supplicating and remembering Allah, it makes your difficulty affairs easy. Whatever difficulty you have, when you remember Allah, it makes it easy. And it lightens the burden. It lightens the burden. He says, فَمَنْ ذَكَرَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ عَلَى سَعْبٍ إِلَّا حَانَ So no one remembers Allah at a time of difficulty except that Allah will make it easy for him. Allah عز وجل would make his affairs easy for him. Then he says, فَذِكْرُ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى هُوَ الْفَرَجُ بَعْدَ الشِّدَّةِ وَالْيُسْرُ بَعْدَ الْعُسْرِ وَالْفَرَجُ بَعْدَ الْغَمِّ وَالْحَمِّ He said, so indeed the remembrance of Allah is Allah giving ease after difficulty and Allah giving away after things were restrained. <coughs> so the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal, how important is the remembrance of Allah when a person is experiencing difficulty? He also says, he says, أَنَّ ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ يُذْهِبُ عَنِ الْقَلْبِ الْمُخَاوِفُهُ مُخَاوِفَهُ كُلَّهُ وَلَهُ تَعْثِيرٌ عَجِيبٌ فِي هُصُولِ الْأَمَنِ He said, indeed, the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal removes the fear from the heart. Indeed, the remembrance of Allah removes the fear from the heart. And it has an amazing impact on bringing about safety and comfort. Bringing about safety and comfort. So, he said, فَلَيْسَ لِلْخَائِفْ أَلَّذِي قَدَّ اشْتَدَّ خَوْفُهُ أَنْفَعَ مِنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَالِ He says, there's no, there's nothing for the person who has fear, there's nothing for the person who has fear more beneficial than for him to remember Allah Azza wa Jal. For him to remember Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's why we have here, what the author mentioned, amongst the most effective means to prepare for future affairs is implementing the supplication that the Prophet Sallallahu used to say. So the dhikr of Allah and the dua of Allah Azza wa Jal is, the most, is from the most important things that help you have comfort, relaxation as it relates to the future of your affairs. Read the dua again. The same dua. Prophet ﷺ Make life a further means for me for all that is good, and death an alleviation from all that is evil. So we find that our Messenger وسلم, has taught us this dua and other supplications. So it's upon the believers, if you truly want comfort and safety, it's upon the believers to memorize these supplications of the Prophet And we don't only, uh, we don't only, or the scholars of Islam, don't only encourage us with this, but other supplications. As we mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ said that there's no believer that's afflicted with a calamity or a trial. And he says, Allahumma inni abduk, to the end of that dua, Oh Allah, I am your servant, I am the son of your servant, I am the son of your female servant, to the likes. So there were several supplications that our beloved Prophet ﷺ used to supplicate with. So it's upon the believer to memorize those supplications. Those supplications and other supplications, even from yourself. Even from yourself, you make dua. Islam encourages you to memorize these and to also supplicate for things that you, that you need specifically. Islam encourages that. But the point is that you do it and your heart is engaged. That you do it and your heart is engaged. And because of that, the Salaf used to say, it's not from the Sunnah to always ask others to supplicate for you. It's not from the Sunnah to ask others to supplicate for you, to constantly ask others to supplicate for you. Why? 
Because the person that you ask to supplicate for you, he cannot have the intensity in the supplication like you have it. He's not experiencing the difficulty that you're experiencing. His heart hasn't been broken, crying at night, worry and fear like you have. So when he makes dua for you, how is his heart going to be, how is his heart going to be focused like your heart is going to be focused? So that's one of the reasons why in Islam, the individual is encouraged to make his, dua, his own dua. Why? Because the stronger your heart is engaged in the dua, the more it would be answered. The more it would be answered. But the importance is for the believer to supplicate to Allah Azza wa Jal. As it was mentioned by Ibn al-Jawzi and Sayyid al-Khatir, Ibn al-Jawzi, in one of his books, he said, فَأَمَّنْ رُزِكَ مَعْرِفَةُ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى إِسْتِرَاحَ لِأَنَّهُ يَسْتَغْنِي بِالْرِضَى بِالْقَدْرِ فَمَحْمَا قُدِّرَ لَهُ رَدِيَ وَإِنْ دَعَى فَلَمْ يَرَى أَثَرَ الْإِجَابَةِ لَمْ يَقْتَلِجْ فِي قَلْبِهِ اِعْتِرَادِ لأنه مملوك مدبر فتكون همته في خدمة الخالق He said whoever knows Allah has a relationship with Allah strengthen his relationships with Allah whoever knows Allah this individual is in a state of comfort because he's content with divine decree no matter what takes place he's pleased with it no matter what takes place He's pleased with it. He says some more speech, but we won't translate, translate the rest. As for this dua, where the Prophet ﷺ said, O oh Allah, rectify my religion, which is the safeguard of all of my affairs. <laughs> rectify for me my worldly affairs, in which is my livelihood. And rectify for me my hereafter, which is in my afterlife. Make a life Make life a further means for me for all that is good and death and alleviation for all that is evil. Imam al-Shawkani, rahmatullahi alayhi, and says, says in Tathkirat al-Dhakirin, he says, هذا الحديث من جوامع الكلم He said, this hadith is from the concise statements of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a small wording, but it has a tremendous meaning. It has tremendous meaning. لِشُمُولِهِ لِسِلَاحِ الدُّنْيَا وَالدِّينِ He said, لِسِلَاحِ الدِّينِ وَالدُّنْيَا He said, because this hadith, or this dua, of the Prophet ﷺ, it rectifies your deen, and it rectifies your dunya. وَوَصَفَ إِسْلَاحِ الدِّينِ بِأَنَّهُ عِسْمَةُ بِأَنَّهُ عِسْمَةُ عَمْرِهِ لِأَنَّ السَّلَاحَ الدِّينِ هُوَ الرَّأْسُ الْمَالِ الْعَبْدِ وَغَايَةُ مَا يَطْلُبُهُ He said in this dua, the Prophet ﷺ has described the religion with, what did he describe the religion with ﷺ? This, what he said? The safeguard, of all my affairs. the safeguard of all my affairs. So the Prophet ﷺ described the religion with the safeguard of all your affairs. Because when the, person's, when the person's religion is rectified, this is the most important thing in your life. This is the most important thing in your life. So you begin with the dua that Allah rectifies your religion. The most important thing to you, that which, yeah, my dear brothers and sisters, if Allah took away dunya, Allah can bring it back again. If Allah took away wealth, Allah can bring it back again. If Allah took away possessions and assets, Allah can bring it back again. But what about the religion of the individual? An individual at one time was poor. And then he worked hard and became rich. He became comfortable and the likes. So if an individual loses wealth, but Allah gives him life, that individual can work again once again to obtain that. But if an individual loses his religion, if an individual loses his religion, is he guaranteed that Allah will give it to him again? Why? What's the difference? Because your religion is not because of you. 
your religion. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna li nahtadi lawla an hadana Allah. The believers will say in Jinnah, all praise be to Allah who guided us to this. We would have not have been guided if Allah did not guide us. So once again, if you lose wealth, if you lose wife, if you lose child, if you lose assets, if you lose house, if you lose car, you can work for it again and get it again. But if you lose deen, that's not in your hands. If you walk away from Islam and turn your back on Islam, you can't say, I'm weak now, I'm struggling now, I'm going to leave Islam for some time, but it's okay, I can get it back. No, because you didn't get it in the first place because of you. It was Allah that gave you deen. So you can't risk losing your deen because there's no chance that you're going to get it again. So the way of the believer, oh Allah, rectify my religion. Rectify my religion. No matter what I lose, I cannot lose my religion. I can get money again. I can get another wife. I can have more children. I can get all of worldly assets again. I can get those things. I can work hard for those things. But the thing that you cannot guarantee that you will get back is your religion. So the believer works hard and makes dua to that Allah Azawajal keeps him upon his religion. And that's why we say every day, what? Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path and keep. And my, my dear brothers, we are Muslim. Alhamdulillah. And my dear sisters, we are Muslim. So when you say, as the scholars of Tafsir said, when you say guide us to the straight path, you're not asking to become a Muslim. You're asking Allah to keep you as a Muslim. You're asking Allah Azawajal to keep you upon that path. Not that you're asking to be guided to that path because you're already upon that path. But what you're asking Allah Azawajal is to keep you upon that path until death. As Allah Azawajal says, وَعْبُدُوا رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Worship your Lord until certainty comes to you. What is certainty? Death. Death. So here in this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu taught us to ask Allah Azawajal to rectify our religion, which is the safeguard of all our affairs. And it's the most important thing that we can seek. And then the Prophet ﷺ asked Allah to rectify our dunya. Why? Because our livelihood is in this dunya. This is the world that we live in. As Allah says, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَسِيبَكَ مِنَ dunya." Do not forget that you have to have a portion of this dunya. So you ask Allah to rectify your dunya. He's Ibn, uh, Imam Shokani says, وَوَصَفَ إِسْلَاحِ الدُّنْيَا بِأَنَّهَا مَكَانُ بِأَنَّهَا مَكَانُ مَعَاشِهِ أَلَّذِي لَا بُدَّ مِنْهُ فِي حَيَاتِهِ You ask Allah to rectify your dunya because you live in this dunya and you have to live in this dunya. You have to live in it. You can't just walk away from the dunya. This is where Allah Azawajal has given you your life. So you don't try to just no longer, it's no such thing. It's not, it's not sound intellect to say, I'm not going to be in the dunya anymore. You're going to be in the dunya. But the Prophet ﷺ has said, Kun fi dunya ka Be in this life as if you are a stranger. But what did the Prophet say? Be in this life. So you're not turning away from this life, but you're asking Allah to keep you guided in this life. And you're asking Allah to rectify your affairs in this life. And then he says, وَسَأَلَهُ إِسْلَاحَ آخِرَتِهِ الَّتِي هِيَ الْمَرْجِعِ And you ask Allah to rectify your hereafter because that is where you're going to return. Because that is where you're going to return. So the way of the believer, the way of the believer is that the believer asks Allah Azawajal to rectify their deen because they are, it's the most important thing that an individual has. Likewise, to rectify the dunya because you have to live in this dunya and likewise to rectify the hereafter because that is where we're going to return. That is where we're going to return. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَجْعَلْ حَيَاتِي زَيَادَةً لِي فِي كُلِّ خَيْرٍ Make my life an increase in all forms of good. 
and waj'al mawt waj'al al-mawt rahatan li fi kulli shar min kulli shar and make my death a comfort from all forms of evil so the individual acknowledges that he lives in this life and there is evil and there is good and as long as he lives he as he aspires to obtain that good and when death comes alhamdulillah death removes the evil. Now, the next hadith, the next dua. Similarly, similarly his sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Allahumma rahmataka arju, fala takilni ila nafsi tarfata'ayn, wa aslih li shakni kullah, la ilaha illa. Oh Allah, it is only your mercy I hope for, so do not leave me to myself for the blinking of an eye. Rectify all of my affairs, and none has the right to be worshipped but you. So this is another hadith and many more. Yani the author, Shaykh Abdul Rahman al-Sa'di, he only mentioned two hadiths. But there are many more that the Prophet ﷺ has taught us to supplicate with when we are in a state of distress. We are in a state of anxiety or grief and the likes. There are many dua and we should memorize those supplications. But in this one, the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Allah, it is your mercy that I seek. And like we mentioned... The importance of dua, like the prophets and the messengers, and our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, turning to Allah. So you do not, the believer does not believe that he can overcome the difficulties and challenges of life by himself. By himself, you have to turn to Allah azza wa jal, and you have to establish a strong relationship with Allah azza wa jal. You have to establish a strong relationship with Allah Azza wa Jalla. And because of that, Imam Ibn al-Jawzi rahmatullahi alayhi said in the previous book, Sayyid al-Khatir, he said, Ra'aytu sabab al-humumi wal-ghumumi al-i'radu anillahi Azza wa Jalla. He said, Naam. He said, Wal-iqbalu ala dunya he said, I saw, I noticed that the reason from anxiety and fear is individuals turning away from Allah Azza wa Jal and focusing on the dunya. As Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَعْرَدَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً دَنْكَ Whoever turns away from my remembrance, he will have a very difficult life. So the believer understands you will experience trials and tribulations. But once again, you put those trials and tribulations in proper perspective. Maybe this is a, a punishment for what I did. And alhamdulillah, Allah has given me this punishment now. And not saving this punishment for the hereafter. And maybe Allah Azza wa Jal wants to put me in a higher place in Jannah. But my deeds are deficient. So Allah has given me a trial and tribulation so that I can get in that higher part of Jinnah. And maybe this trial and tribulation is an expiation for my sins. And Allah Azza wa Jal tested his prophets and his messengers and the likes. So the believer returns his affair to Allah Azza wa Jal and he does not remain in a state of ang anxiousness or anxiety and a state of grief and a state of worry. The believer turns to Allah Azza wa Jal and he puts his trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the strong believers. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to strengthen our hearts. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to keep us on his straight path and to save us in this life and the next. Allah knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka na nabiyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslim in kathir. I realized something. There was a paragraph. Yeah. Naam, afwan. Finish the paragraph. If the servant continually calls upon Allah with this supplication, which comprises of the rectification of his future religious and worldly affairs, with an attentive heart... And Notice, put a line, with an attentive heart. That was the statement of Ibn Qayyim from Adda'u ad dawa an attentive heart. It's not this, just you just say, say the supplication. You have to do it with an attentive heart. And what was the example Ibn Qayyim gave? The bow and arrow. The bow and arrow. Tfadl. With an attentive heart and a sincere intention, while striving to attain this. While striving to attain this. So, so one, you make dua. Two, while you're making that dua, you have to have an attentive heart. And three, 
while striving, you're striving. So you're making dua, your heart is engaged, and you're striving. You're not sitting. Why? How? This shouldn't have happened. No, no, no. You don't ask any of those questions. You're making dua. Your heart is engaged, very attentive, from the bottom of your heart, and you're striving to the best of your ability. You're striving to the best of your ability. Now, then Allah will grant him what he has asked, hoped for, and acted to accomplish, and his anxiety will transform into happiness and joy. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And likewise, a believer should also remember. It's possible Allah doesn't give it to you in this life, but Allah saves it for you in the next life. But you know that Allah Azawajal is going to answer your dua. But maybe Allah saves it in the next life because maybe in this life it's harmful for you. Are you more knowledgeable or Allah? So you think something's good for you, but maybe it's harmful for you. In this life, so Allah saves it for you for the next life. But the point is, you leave that affair with Allah Azza wa Jal. You leave that affair with Allah Azza wa Jal. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us from the true believers. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to fill our hearts with iman and taqwa and dependence upon Allah. Allah knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakan Muhammad. 